Welcome to our next unit on the evaluation of ML systems. In this lesson, we take a deeper look at binary classification and corresponding measures, which we call ROC measures. ROC analysis is all about evaluating binary classification systems for imbalanced class label situations. Imbalanced label situations are situations in which one of the two classes is much smaller than the other class. Often the smaller class is also of higher importance than the larger class. So for example, consider a binary classifier for diagnosing a serious medical condition. Let's assume that our label distribution is imbalanced. So fortunately, not too many people have the disease that we want to model here. And assume that, for example, only 0.5% of 1,000 patients actually have this very rare disease. Now, evaluating any classification system on that task with something like the misclassification error or the accuracy is obviously inappropriate. Consider, for example, the constant classifier that always returns the label no disease. A very stupid classifier that doesn't look at any features. It just constantly spits out no disease, no disease, no disease for each and every patient. If you evaluate this type of system with the normal misclassification error, well, this system does very well. It has a misclassification error rate of only 0.5%. This sounds pretty good, right? But if you think about this a bit more, this is the worst system ever and hopefully not implemented because this system will say nobody has the disease and send everybody home, including the patients who have the disease. This problem is also known as the accuracy paradox. The paradox states that for this binary imbalanced situation, it's not too smart to only look at accuracy because that can be strongly misleading. But what should we do instead? Wait and learn. There's another very much related point of view to understand this problem. Instead of through the lens of imbalanced class labels, we will now view the problem through the lens of imbalanced classification costs. In our example, if you would classify a sick patient as not sick, this should usually come along with a higher cost than classifying a healthy patient as sick. These costs, these misclassification costs, should depend on what happens after we've produced that classification. Imagine patients classified as sick are sent to another more thorough expensive screening. Patient classified as not sick are sent home. In these cases where we do the thorough screening, we can still figure out whether we classified um, this patient incorrectly as sick. Erroneously subjecting someone to the screening is obviously not good from a psychological and economic perspective. But sending someone home who's sick and will likely get worse or even die is clearly much, much worse. And we want to avoid that at all costs. Such a situation not only arises if we have imbalanced label distributions, but also when, well, these costs that are connected with our decision-making process differ quite strongly. So we could also see this as a problem of imbalanced costs rather than uh, imbalanced class labels. And imbalanced class costs um, could also occur even if label distributions are perfectly equal. Both of these situations are tightly connected. If we could specify these imbalance costs, we could precisely evaluate against this custom cost measure. And we might even optimize our machine learning model on the insight directly through empirical risk minimization against this cost matrix. There is a specific subfield in machine learning, which is called cost sensitive learning, which deals with um, exactly this type of problem. Unfortunately, it is, un it is usually very difficult to um, 
come up with precise cost numbers, so we can't always do that. In the following, we assume that we have no knowledge about costs. What we are going to do in this unit is to create different metrics to evaluate a binary system from different perspectives. This often helps us to get a first impression of the quality of the system. Um, ROC analysis deals with exactly this. First, we are now going to introduce more and new alternative metrics for binary systems. Let's look at our two by two confusion metrics again, which tabulates the predictions versus actual classes. This confusion matrix uh, tabulates how many correct and incorrect labelings happened in the respective entries. In this unit, we will only consider binary system and I will call one of the classes the positive class and one the negative class. Their respective class sizes we denote by n plus and an n minus. So n plus for the positive class and n minus for the negative class. The positive class usually does not have anything positive associated with it. Positive class means it's the important class. It's often the smaller class. It contains the elements you don't want to miss. In engineering, you may, might call this class the signal class. In um, medicine, it would be the, the disease class. Um, so not positive at all. We call the entries in the, confusion in, in the confusion matrix true positive, false positive, false negative, and true negative. So the second part of this term specifies what we predicted and the first part of uh, the term specifies whether the prediction was correct or not. Okay, now let's get to our new measures, the ROC mat metrics. The basic ROC metrics are defined by the entries in the confusion matrix, divided by either the respective row sum or column sum what we get are rates, rates of true positives, for example. This we call the true positive rate. It tells us how many of the ones or positives we actually predicted as ones or positives. And then the, there's the true negative rate. Um, the true negative rate is the proportion of elements from the negative class that we predicted as being negative we can do pretty much the same row-wise. Uh, we can specify something that's called the positive predictive value, which is the number of true positives divided by the number of elements that we predicted as being positive. The negative predictive value works in the same fashion. There is a very intuitive way of understanding what these metrics mean. True positive rate is how many of the true positive elements did we also predict as positive? While the positive predictive value is, if we predict an object as belonging to a cla to class one, um, how likely is it that this object is really of class one? Or if you again consider the medical scenario, the PPV tells you if your medical test assigns you to the disease, how likely do you truly have it? TPR tells you if you have the disease, how likely does your test assign you to the disease class or detect that disease? Now you probably wonder why we call these measures ROC metrics. Well, the reason for that is historical. ROC stands for Receiver Operating Characteristics. They were developed by electrical engineers and radar engineers during World War II. Today it is used in many other fields, which deal with the evaluation of binary systems. Psychology, um, for the percep um, perceptual detection of stimuli, or in medicine, I already gave an example for that, um, radiology, forecasting of hazards, and so on. We still use the name originating from engineering though, which is kind of confusing, but just the way it is. 
Here's a small example um, for the ROC metrics from a medical test. In this case, we have a screening system for bowel cancer detection. This is a pretty rare disease. So in this case, we only have 30 patients who have the disease. We have a control group of 2000 patients who don't have the disease. The confusion matrix shows the number of correctly and incorrectly classified patients. You can see the various computations for the ROC metrics. You can, for example, see the 30 elements in the positive class. We detected um, 20 of those, resulting in a TPR of two thirds. For the positive predictive value, 20 of the 200 positive predicted patients actually have the disease. So the PPV is 10%. This means if the classifier says that you have bowel cancer, it is actually more likely that you don't have bowel cancer. Out of 10 people where the classifier says they have the disease, only one actually has it. We can now start discuss discussing how much we like this binary system. First, uh, of all, we miss one third of sick patients. We're not, we're not detecting them correctly. While if this medical test tells you that you have the disease, you actually probably don't have it. This doesn't seem too good on both fronts. Now there's even more ROC metrics that you can create from this two by two confusion matrix. Um, there's, for example, the false negative rate, which is simply one minus the treat positive rate. Or you have here the um, false positive rate, um, which is one minus the true negative rate. And then there's, for example, the prevalence or the false emission rate or all these other measures listed here. From this table, you can also see one unfortunate aspect um, because all of these measures are discussed in different fields like psychology and engineering. There's usually two or three different terms for the same concept, exactly the same. So true positive rate is also called recall and is also called sensitivity. False positive rate is also called fallout, for example. Um, the true negative rate is also called specificity. Yeah, and so on and so on. I try to avoid all of these alternative names in this unit. Um, if you want to read more on this, you can, um, for example, go to Wikipedia, where we took this matrix from, uh, or go to the interactive um, diagram linked here, which shows you how all of these measures are calculated in detail. Um, before we finish this unit, I want to talk about one particular measure, which builds on the measures we looked at so far. It's called the F1 measure. As we have seen from the previous example on bowel cancer, it's often um, very difficult to achieve simultaneously a high positive predictive value and a high TPR. Well, if you can somehow improve your classifier so it predicts more positives than before, yes, this will result in a higher TPR, but this will also result usually in a higher number of false positives because you're now predicting more observations as positives and this is usually the price you pay. So increasing your TPR usually results in a lower PPV and vice versa. Well, also if you do the opposite and you somehow change your classifier in such a way that it predicts more negatives, you will have a higher PPV, but your TPR usually goes down. So in a certain sense, there's an inherent trade-off between these two measures, and it might be an interesting idea to try to balance these two conflicting goals. The F1 measure is one way to do it. It is simply the harmonic mean between PPV and TPR. If you haven't heard of the harmonic mean before, in maths, there's three types of mean or averaging function. There's the usual mean, also called arithmetic mean, the geometric mean, and then the harmonic mean. For two elements, the harmonic mean is simply two times the product divided by the sum. Note that, um, yeah, we are trying to 
balance out here PPV and TPR, but this measure doesn't really take into account the number of true negatives. Here you see a table of different combina combinations of TPR and PPV. And what you can see from this is that the harmonic mean tends more strongly than the normal average or the geometric mean towards the smaller of the two elements. For example, let's say you have a TPR of 1 and a PPV of 0.6. So the normal average would result in a value of 0.8, while the harmonic mean of the F1 measure results in 0.75. And nicely, a model with TPR equals zero, where you didn't predict anything as positive, or a binary system with a positive predictive value of zero, so um, where no real positive values were among the predictive positives. Both of these systems always have an F1 um, score of zero. You can also uh, ask yourself, what is the F1 of a constant system that always predicts the negative class label? Well, in this case, if you always predict the negative class, then the TPR is zero. So F1 is zero. That's easy to see. If you always predict positive, things are not so simple or, well, F1 is not exactly zero. What happens then is that the true positive rate is exactly one because everything from the positive class you're also labeling as positive. So the F1 formula reduces to two times PPV divided by PPV plus one. And with a few calculations, you can show that this reduces even further to two times uh, N plus. So the size of the positive class divided by N plus plus N. This is simply due to the fact that the PPV in this case is simply n plus divided by n because you're predicting everything as positive. So the number of elements that you predict as positive is n. Well, and of these n plus elements, you have predicted correctly um, as positive. And if you positive class is rather small, then also the F1 will be rather small, which you can directly see from this formula. The F1 metric allows you to balance out PPV and true positive rate in a single number. This is often useful, but not always reasonable. In order to really talk about one single metric for these imbalanced cases, you would really have to specify your precise cost in a cost matrix, and we just assumed that we can't do that. What this basically means is that there is no single perfect metric, or we are actually missing some information to come up with a single quantitative number to evaluate a bi binary system. F1 is a possibility, but F1 implicitly assumes a certain cost structure that we haven't explicitly written down. Now, of course, you can still use F1. Whether this really reflects what you want in practice is another matter. You may want to use a visual tool for understanding model performance in these situations. This, however, is part of another unit.